Hi, this is Mrs. Robel. This is Chapter 7, Ionic Compounds and Metals. This is Part 2. In this video, we're going to look at Type 2 binary compounds, and then we're going to name ionic compounds using polyatomic ions. Okay, so Type 2 compounds, what do they mean? Um, these are actually transition metals, and as a result of it, we have to use Roman numerals, and we put it in parentheses after the name, because there could be multiple um, cations for one element. Notice that we still name the cation first and then we name the anion second, but we put a Roman numeral in parentheses after the cation's name. Okay, so examples. Here we have cobalt and chlorine, and it becomes cobalt 3 chloride. So if you were to look at just the cation by itself, it would essentially have cobalt with a 3 plus charge next to it. Here we have uh, copper and iodine, and together they form copper 1 iodide, tin with bromine, and it forms tin Roman numeral 4 bromide. We have iron with oxygen, and it forms an iron Roman numeral 3 oxide. And then lastly, we have lead with sulfur, and that forms a lead 2 sulfide. So here's a flowchart for naming binary compounds. Notice that you need to look and see, is there a metal present? And that's going to be the cation. Um, if there isn't a metal present, that's going to be considered type 3, and we'll talk about that next chapter. But if there is a metal present, the question is, does it form more than one cation? So notice how if it's type 2, um, we're going to use a Roman numeral after the element's name because there might be more than one charge for that transition metal. Okay, now we want to talk about polyatomic ions. Now notice poly means many, so we're talking about many atoms. And typically it's two or more types of atoms and together they carry an overall net charge that's either positive or negative. So as a result of this, we tend to put parentheses around them just to show that there's an overall charge with those two, two types of elements. Here is a table of polyatomic ions. I will give that to you because there's no way I expect you to memorize all the different polyatomic ions. But I'll just go over a couple examples of them with you here. Uh, here we have hydroxide, which is OH, and its overall charge is a negative 1. Um, here we have ammonium, and it's nitrogen, hydrogen, and its overall charge is a positive 1. And then here we have uh, sulfite, it's sulfur and oxygen, and its overall charge is a 2 minus. Okay. Now, uh, to sort of make some sense of why we're putting subscripts where we're putting them, um, we're going to use the crisscross method to determine the subscripts if we know the metal and the nonmetal in our compound. So the first thing is you want to figure out which one's the cation, which one's the anion. And remember, the metal gets named first. And you also need to determine the charge that the anion or the cation form. And remember, it's based on the group. Um, the first column, the alkali metals will form a 1 plus charge. The alkaline earth will form a 2 plus charge. And magnesium is a 2 plus from the alkaline earth. And if you were to use the crisscross method, notice that um, if you were to take the charge on the element and bring it down, it becomes the subscript. Here, this is a 1, and it's an understood 1 for magnesium. Now, if you wanted to balance these ions to make sure there's an overall zero charge, notice that we have 1, it's our subscript of magnesium, and it has a 2 plus charge, and we're going to add it to, there's a subscript of 2, and we have an overall minus charge. So we have a positive 2 plus a negative 2, our overall charge is 0. Okay, here's another example, and this is actually using polyatomic ions. So remember, we have two or more 
atoms that are acting like a unit and they can be positive or negatively charged. And um, we're going to do the crisscross method. So here we're essentially making subscripts and we're only bringing down the number, not the charge. There's an understood one here. So it forms a NH4 with a subscript of 3. Now we could draw parentheses around the phosphate, but you don't have to when there isn't an additional subscript. And I know students typically get confused about these subscripts. Remember, they, they stay with the atoms. You don't want to change the subscripts. The only thing you want to change is outside of the polyatomic ion. And uh, this three comes from here. So when we look at it, notice that there's a subscript of three for ammonium and it has an overall one plus charge. We're adding it to an understood one subscript of phosphate, which has a three minus charge. And when you add a positive three to a negative three, you get an overall zero charge. Okay, so you might ask yourself, why do we use Roman numerals? Well, with transition metals, they can form two plus or three plus ions. Um, typically, they can form greater than three plus ions, but we won't necessarily get into that. But please notice that when they lose their electrons, they tend to form what we call pseudo noble gases. So they become like a noble gas. They still retain the number of protons, but um, they obviously lose electrons to have a more stable configuration. Okay, so in summary, we look at the ratio of cations to anions to figure out the net neutral ionic charge of a compound. Um, you use Roman numerals when there's different oxidation states for cations. And polyatomic ions consist of two or more atoms that act as a unit together. And we use parentheses to help um, keep that together. And then lastly, we include a subscript if it's needed.